If you're a rigid pedal weaver, most likely you've been using what's called direct warping. Your warp is being put directly on the loom as you wind the warp. For the quartet, you will need to use what is called indirect warping. We will wind the warp ahead of time with a warping board or a set of warping pegs, then bring it to the loom. Let's start by using a warping peg set. First, we'll need to clamp the single peg to a work surface. This is best to use on a sturdy surface. This peg will now become our starting peg. The next step is to measure the distance of your warp from the starting peg. Here, we are making a warp that is 40 inches long. Once you measure the distance, clamp the double peg, which is also known as the cross pegs, to a surface at this point. The distance between the starting peg and the furthest cross peg should be the same as your warp length. The two pegs can be clamped to the same surface or different surfaces, depending on the warp length you need. They should form a straight line and be easy to maneuver between. Now we can start winding the warp. Tie your warp yarn to the starting peg. Carry it to the cross pegs and wind a figure eight around these pegs. Go over the first peg, around the second, then under the first peg. This forms what we call our cross, which will keep our warp ends in order when we bring them over to the loom. Bring the warp yarn back to the starting peg and wrap around that. Then go back up to the cross pegs and make your figure eight again. You'll continue going back and forth in this motion until you have all the warp ends you need. I like to count my ends at the cross. When I have my total number of warp ends, I cut the final thread and tie it around my starting peg if I have an even number of warp threads, or around my final cross peg if I have an odd number of warp threads. The most important part of this is making sure that my cross is secure. The first tie I like to have is one that holds the entire cross. Use a scrap yarn that is a contrasting color from your warp. Place it down through one side of the cross, around the back of the cross, and up through the other side. Tie this loosely with a square knot on top of the cross. Then, tie each of the four sections of the cross with loose square knots. The final ties I need to add are what are called choke ties. I tie these tightly with a bow. This makes it easy to untie, but tight around the warp to prevent tangling. Take the chain off the starting peg and tie an overhand knot at the end. Then chain your warp. Wrap the end of your warp chain around your wrist with the end on top. This is now your bracelet. Grab the remaining length and pull it through your bracelet. Take the cross off the warping board or pegs and bring it over to the loom. This process is very similar on a warping board. I use what's called a guide string to get my needed warp length. Start by making your guide string that is the length of your warp plus eight inches. The eight inches allows me to have enough extra length to tie around the pegs at the beginning and the end. 
Here, I'm measuring a warp that is two yards long. So I measure 36 inches two times, then eight inches. Once I have my guide string, I tie it to one of the pegs on the side of the warping board. Then I go back and forth across the warping board, finding a path that makes sense for my warp length. I'm looking to have my guide string go under all three pegs at the bottom of the warping board. This will be important for me to make my cross. Sometimes it takes a few tries to figure out what will work best and that's okay. Sometimes I even have to end up moving where my starting peg is. When I have the path for my guide string figured out, I will start winding my warp. Tie your warp yarn to the starting peg, then follow the guide string. When you get to the bottom, go under the first two pegs, wrap around the third, then over the middle peg and under the final peg. This forms your cross, which should look like a figure eight. Follow the guide string back to the starting peg and wrap around. Continue this process for your number of warp ends. I like to count my warp threads at the cross, pulling up the individual thread as I count. Each thread will become one warp end on my loom. Sometimes, if I have a large number of warp ends, I will separate them into groups. The most important part of this is making sure that my cross is secure, which means that we will need to have several ties around the cross. The first tie I like to have is one that holds the entire cross. Use a scrap yarn that is a contrasting color from your warp. Place it down through one side of the cross, around the back of the cross, and up through the other side. Tie this loosely with a square knot on top of the cross. Then, tie each of the four sections of the cross with loose square knots. The final ties I need to add are what are called choke ties. This keeps the chain from getting tangles. I make my first one 10 inches or so from the cross. Then I continue down the warp, tying choke ties every 18 inches or so. I tie these tightly with a bow. This makes it easy to untie, but tight around the warp to prevent tangling. Take the chain off the starting peg and tie an overhand knot at the end. I like to
like to leave them as loops and then cut all the ends to the same length when my warp is on the loom. Then chain your warp. Wrap the end of your warp chain around your wrist with the end on top. This is now your bracelet. Grab the remaining length and pull it through your bracelet, just enough so that this can now become your bracelet. Continue until you are six or so inches from the cross. Take the cross off the warping board or pegs and bring it over to the loom. When you get to your loom, start by placing the beater at the very front of the loom. I like to have the beater bottom rest on the cloth beam and the reed rest against the front beam. This allows me the room I need for my hands and keeps everything organized. I have my warp chain in the Cricut trap. You could also have your chain wrapped around the cloth beam if you don't have a Cricut trap. Then we'll measure the reed to make sure that our weaving is centered. I take a tape measure and find the middle point of my reed. Then Go over to the left, half the width of my weaving. Here, I am going over three inches from the center because my weaving is six inches wide. I take a scrap piece of yarn and mark that point, tying the end around the top of the beater. This ensures that I won't lose my spot. Then, we can start slaying the reed. I hold my cross in my dominant hand. I generally recommend that people hold the cross in their non-dominant hand, as this is generally more comfortable. You can try both ways and see what feels more comfortable for you. I place the loop of the cross around my middle finger, one end between my index finger and my thumb, and the other between my ring finger and my pinky. This ensures that the cross is separated and will stay organized. Once my cross is securely on my hand, I take and cut the ties around the cross. Be careful to only cut the ties and not your warp threads. When I'm ready, I can cut the top loop. I take my scissors and cut all the ends into individual ends. Now it's time to start slaying. I take the top two ends off my cross. Depending on your desired set and read size, you may only take off one thread, or you may take off two, or three, or more. For my set, I am placing two ends in each dent of my reed. Take the top two threads off the top of the cross. Once you get used to this, it is easy to tell which is the top. I then take them all the way off my hand and place my threading hook through the back of the reed at my starting point, with the hook facing up. Hook my two threads to that hook and pull through. I then repeat the process for the next two threads. Take two threads from the top, pull them all the way off your hand, place the threading hook through the back of the reed in the next dent, hook the threads and pull them through. Continue across the width of your weaving. After I've done an inch or a little more, I like to take those ends and tie them. Then, just in case this gets pulled, the threads will stay through the reed. Making sure that my cross is securely in my hand, I grab the group, comb through them to get out any tangles, and then tie an easy to undo knot. Keep going across the warp, repeating these steps.
Once your ends are all slayed through the reed, it's time to thread. Flip your loom around. The shafts are numbered from the front of the loom. Number one is the closest to the front of the loom, and number four is the furthest from the front of the loom. I like to thread from the center of my warp. That way I don't need to count out the exact number of heddles ahead of time, and I don't have a big group of heddles in the center. So I find the middle point, and then take the first two threads from one dent in my reed. One of those threads will go through a heddle on the first shaft. I am looking at my pattern and following the order given from right to left. So I pull a heddle from the first shaft and put one thread through that heddle. Then, I take a heddle from the second shaft and put the other thread through that heddle. I fold the yarn so that I have a loop at the end and place that loop through the heddle. This makes it easier to thread the end in my opinion. I then go back to the reed and grab the next set of two. I make sure that it is the next dent in the reed, otherwise I will end up with cross threads and I need to go back and fix that mistake. I thread one of those threads through a heddle on the third shaft, then the other one through a heddle on the fourth shaft. Now I can go back to the beginning of that sequence. Thread one, two, three, and then four. Once I have done a couple of sets, I like to go back and make sure that I did it correctly. I go back to the beginning and count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Then I also double check that I have the correct number of heddles on each shaft. So for my pattern, I should have two heddles on each shaft since I have done two sequences. This makes it so that even if there is somehow a mistake in the threading, I at least have the correct number of heddles and can therefore fix my mistake. I tie off that group into an easy to undo knot. Some people find it easier to thread using a threading hook. So you could take your thread and place the threading hook through to grab your thread and pull through. For some, this is faster. I recommend that you try both ways and decide what feels more comfortable for you. Once I get to the side, I will leave one thread not through a heddle. This is what is called a floating selvage. I recommend this for any non-plain weave pattern. If you want to try a twill, overshot, etc., you want to be sure you have a floating selvage. Then I'll go back to the center point and start threading the other side. Here's where it gets a little tricky. Since I threaded right to left on my diagram on that side, I now have to thread left to right. This is because I started threading from the center. So I will start with a thread that goes through a heddle on shaft four, then three, then two, then one. I will then start over and repeat that same pattern. I'll do that a couple times, check my work, and then move on to the next section.
when I get to the other side, I again leave a floating sewage. Once all my threads are through the heddles, it is time to tie onto the back apron bar. There are several ways you can go about doing this. Here, I'll show you one option. I'll start by bringing the apron bar up and over the back bead. I take two of my original groups, which gives me 16 threads in the group. You'll want to make sure that your groups are large enough to make a good size knot, but also not more than an inch. Two large of groups may cause tension issues later. An inch or slightly smaller will be perfect. Take your group and untie them from the original knots. Tie into an overhand knot, then place the group over the apron bar. Bring the knot end under the apron bar, then through the loop that is created. Then pull the warp to tighten. Repeat on all groups. Sometimes the length of yarn are slightly different, and this is okay. You can spend time getting it evened out, but it will also even out as you wind on, so don't worry about it too much. I like to make sure my groups are not twisted before tying them on. That way they are clean, and it minimizes any tension issues. Once all those are tied on, we can start winding the warp onto the warp beam. Start by combing through the warp with your hands at the front of the loop. This gets out any tangles. Then start winding the crank, pulling back on the warp slightly with one hand and cranking with the other. If you feel any resistance or see tangles start to form at the front of the loom, comb through the warp again with your hands. You will need to untie your choke ties as they get close to the front of the loom. Continue winding until the warp is about to overlap the knots. At this point, you will need to insert a warp separator, paper or cardboard. Place your warp separator on top of the knots and wind on just enough for it to hold. Then use your hand to pull on the warp and continue winding. As you come across choke ties, untie them. Keep pulling the warp with one hand and winding with the other. If you run out of warp separator, add on more and keep winding. Once your overhand knot reaches the front beam, you can stop and we can move on to the next step. Untie your overhand knot at the front of the loom and cut to individual ends. I like to cut off just a little bit of the warp to even out my warp lengths. Then I tie the warp in an easy to undo knot. That way, just in case anything was to happen to my warp, it won't come out of the reed or the heads. Bring your apron bar over the front beam. If you have the trap on your loom, be sure that you go through the gap between the trap and the loom and not all the way around the trap with the apron bar. Then take one group on one side of your warp. You can tie on in groups of up to an inch. 
I like to have more control over my warp tension, so here I'm going to tie on in groups of 10 threads, which for me is half an inch. Take the first group, bring it over the apron bar, split the group in half, and bring the halves up on both sides of the whole group. Then tie a surgeon's knot, like you are starting to tie a knot, but wrap around twice. Then tighten. You'll do the same on the other side of the warp. Bring the group over the apron bar, wrap around, split the group in half, bring the halves up on both sides, and then tie a surgeon's knot. Continue tying surgeon's knots for each of the groups across the width of the warp. When all the groups have been tied on, we can tighten them. Take the two ends, pull them back towards the reed, then pull apart. Our goal here isn't super tight tension. The goal is to even out the groups. I generally tighten all the groups and feel the tension. Press down on the warp with your hand and adjust as needed. If a group feels looser than the others, Tighten just slightly more and feel again. Keep making those minor adjustments until it feels consistent across the width of the warp. Once it feels even, I take those ends and tie a bow. If you don't have enough extra length, you can just tie another knot on top. But a bow makes it easier to adjust the tension later, so that is my preference. This holds the surgeon's knots in place as I am weaving. Thanks so much for joining us to learn about the Cricut Quartet. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at info at Thank you and happy weaving.